Okay, we're going to look at part six of Federalist 38. This part is important because he's going to talk about something called Northwest Ordinance. Northwest Ordinance. And when he says Northwest, remember at that time they thought this was the area that would comprise United States. Okay, look at the area that I'm drawing, the red area with the blue areas. So they didn't know what was beyond Mississippi River. They knew Spanish were here, they knew probably uh, Native Americans were here. Okay, but it was not till 1803 when Jeff Thomas Jefferson was president that he sent a team headed by two of his associates or friends, uh, Lewis and Clark, to explore this area. Okay. So this area is considered Northwest Territory and says, if you, I know you can't read this, but this is territory Northwest of Ohio River. And this is the Ohio River right here. See, that's the Ohio River. It separates the state of Kentucky from all these states up here, with Indiana, Ohio. And it's very important to keep this in mind. So we're going to talk about this, and when I get there, I'll tell you more. So I'm going to read to you the very paragraph before the last paragraph. So there's one long paragraph left and a short paragraph. I shall be told that however dangerous this mixture of powers may be in theory, it is rendered harmless by the dependence of Congress on the states for the means of carrying them into practice. That however large the mass of powers may be, it is in fact a lifeless mass. Then say I, in the first place, that the Confederation is chargeable with the still greater folly of declaring certain powers in the federal government to be absolutely necessary, and at the same time, rendering them absolutely nugatory. So this is very important. He's talking about the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. And he's telling these people that are criticizing that the Articles of Confederation, our first Congress, our first Constitution, says there are certain things that the government should be able to do, and at the same time it turns around and it does not give the government the authority and the power to do it. So it just negates the whole thing. It just, it's like it throws the whole thing uh, out of whack. It just ruins the whole experiment. He says, this is one of what we are talking about. This is one of the defects of this confederation. That's why we are writing, we have written this new constitution so that uh, you people will have a better future under the good, better government. And in the next place, that if the union is to continue and no better government be substituted, effective powers must either be granted to or assumed by the existing Congress, in either of which events the contrast just stated will hold good. But this is not all. Out of this lifeless mass has already grown an excrescent power. This lifeless mass, look at how he talks about it. It's like a dead beat body, this Articles of Confederation, this Congress that we have. He says it just cannot do what it takes to do to, uh, for your happiness, for your prosperity. And here, here is the part that you need to pay a little attention to. Out of this lifeless mass has already grown an excrescent power. 
which tends to realize all the dangers that can be apprehended from a defective construction of the supreme government of the Union. It is now no longer a point of speculation and hope that the Western territories is a mine of vast wealth to the United States. And although it is not of such a nature as to extricate them from their present distresses or for some time to come to yield any regular supplies for the public expenses, yes, yet must it hereafter be able, under proper management, both to effect a gradual discharge of the domestic debt and to furnish for a certain period liberal tribute to the federal treasury. A very large proportion of this fund has been already surrendered by individual states, and it may with reason be expected that the remaining states will not persist in withholding similar proofs of their equity and generosity. We may calculate, therefore, that a rich and fertile country of an area equal to the inhabited extended of the United, extent of the United States will soon become a national stock. Congress have assumed the administration of this stock. They have begun to render it productive. Congress have undertaken to do more. They have proceeded to form new states, to erect temporary governments, to appoint officers for them, and to prescribe and prescribe the conditions on which such states shall be admitted to the Confederacy. All this has been done and done without the least color of constitutional authority. Yet no blame has been whispered, no alarm has been sounded. A great and independent fund of revenue is passing into the hands of a single body of men who can raise troops to an indefinite number and appropriate money to their support for an indefinite period of time. And yet there are men who have not only been silent spectators of this prospect, but who are advocates for the system which exhibits it. And at the same time, urge against the new system the objections which we have heard. Would they not act with more consistency in urging the establishment of the latter as no less necessary to guard the Union against the future powers and resources of a body constructed like the existing Congress than to save it from the dangers threatened by the present impotency of that assembly. Okay. He's talking about Northwest Ordinance, and Northwest Ordinance is a law. Okay. He says the Continental Congress, under the, con uh, the Articles of Confederation, has just passed a law that is going to create a government for all this blue area. And in this law, they show at first who is going to govern this whole area. And gradually, as people go to settle in this area, they can request and apply for statehood. And they can, when they meet their requirements, they will become states. Okay? And he says, Congress, the same Congress that's impotent, they cannot do anything. You people who are criticizing us are not saying anything when he, when the Congress just approved of this ordinance. And you know what will happen? It's going to sell all these lands. And if we are under this current constitution, all that money is going to go in the hands of one single body of people. Because under the Articles of Confederation, the Congress does not have a Senate, does not have a House of Representatives, does not have a, a judicial branch, does not have an executive branch. All of it is concentrated in one body. And he says they can 
raise troops, they can hire troops, they can buy arms, and you people who earlier were telling us you don't want a standing militia, you're totally quiet when this thing has happened, when Congress is going to be able to buy all those lands, sell all those lands, get the money, and if it decides to, it can get an army and beat you on the head. So he says, look, these people who are criticizing us do not pay attention to what has just happened, but they're just continuously criticizing us for no reason. They're clueless. And also in this paragraph says, look, people, this area, this blue area, it's going to double the size of the United States when they actually become states. So he says we're going to expand. If we accept this new constitution with the money we get, with the new states that we can get in the union, we can all prosper and we can avoid an eventual war between ourselves because we'll get greedy, one of the states wants more to go to it because they say, well, that piece of land, most of it belongs to us or we need to get more money than the other states. So he says, we've got to be smart from here on out. If we don't accept this new constitution, the old constitution gives the Congress the power to take all that money and if they choose to raise an army and come after you, they can. Or you can accept the new constitution where the power is divided, there are checks and balances, and that your new Congress and your new executive is not going to be able to take advantage of that money and take your liberties away. So keep that in mind. Historian David McCullough is a great storyteller. He's working on a book about this Northwest area that I just told you about. So that book should be out in 2017 or so. So listen to his talks. Go and look at all his talks on C-SPAN, on YouTube. He's a good storyteller, so you can learn a lot about American history. Um, especially this, um, the Northwest Ordinance is very important, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the next section.